Well, we're delighted this evening uh, to have as our first lecturer of the academic year um, uh, Professor Peter Wilson uh, at the University of Sydney. You'll be relieved to hear he didn't come all this way specially. Uh, he's been spending the year in Oxford, first at All Souls, uh, and then at my own old, old college, uh, Corpus Christi, which is small but perfectly formed. Uh, and uh, he, we're, we're really, really very pleased to have him. Um, uh, I've, I've known P Peter for quite, quite a long time, actually. Long time. But, uh, if we tot up the years, it will be very worrying. Um, so we won't do that. Um, he did his first degree in Sydney, um, and it, then his uh, PhD in Cambridge. Uh, and uh, then he um, trans transformed, transmuted himself over to Oxford, uh, where he taught at University College Oxford and then at New College, uh, before returning to, to his alma mater uh, and becoming the William Ritchie Professor of, uh, of Greek. Um, he's written uh, widely and in the most distinguished way on uh, the performance and, and organisation, one might almost say, that, uh, of, of Greek tragedy. Uh, and he's uh, working on a... Um, a big book, um, which I think will, it's fair to say, will replace Pickard Cambridge. <laughs> Is that the idea? Uh, and we're, we're, we're very much look forward to hearing him speak on the politics of Greece's theatrical revolution from about 500 to about 300. I'm going to sit in the front row so I can see the pictures. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Judith, for that, for that generous introduction. And thank you um, to you and to the Society for the invitation to be here. Um, it's not easy to explain what an honour it is, but maybe I could give a suggestion of that by saying I'm probably the only schoolboy in suburban Sydney who, in the late 1970s, used to anticipate the arrival of the Journal of Hellenic Studies as a paid-up member <laughs> with true <laughs> excitement and anticipation. Maybe there were lots of us, I don't know. But, uh, but having come that far to here to give the um, lecture this evening to the Society is a really wonderful, uh, wonderful thing for me. So thank you all. Um, well, as Judith intimated for, we well, shouldn't actually say how long we've been doing it for, but for more than a decade, uh, my colleague in Sydney, Eric Sharpo, and I have been conducting a fundamental review of the evidence for the history of the theatre, um, especially the social and economic history of the theatre from round about 500 to round about 300. Some people, Judith might be among them, describe our project as an attempt to redo Picard Cambridge, the dramatic festivals of Athens hero. And it is that in part. But Picard Cambridge really had no interest in the social and economic or political dimension of theatre. Um, and we, we do. Uh, volume two of our now three volumes, Social and Economic History of the Greek Theatre, is now complete. Sigh of relief. Uh, and this deals with the expansion of theatre from Athens into Attica and throughout the Greek world wherever we could find it in that period. And this evening I want to ask what role, if any, politics played in this what we call the theatrical revolution, this incredibly rapid and far-moving expansion of theatre um, beyond Athens. And I'd ask you to remember two things um, before I begin. The first is really important, and that is that the research in this paper is really completely collaborative research, and you've got to ascribe at least half of it to Eric. So in, viewed in one way, you're getting two for the price of one. In another way, any questions you have that I can't answer, I can say, well, Eric did that bit. Um, <laughs> that's the really important thing, though. This is not solely my own work at all. And the second um, is that this is really a sort of a, um, a high altitude look at the developments. And I don't have time to go into a lot of detail, you may be relieved, that backs up um, the various conclusions. So I'm going to be summarising and giving a few examples of what I think are, are general trends. Well, a short history to the background of the question might begin with the volume uh, published in 1990, Nothing to Do with Dionysus. Got to get that question mark intonation at the end there. Um, in 1990, it was radically new in that, in, at least in Anglophone scholarship, in that it focused on the question of theatre's politics in the abstract. But it was also the last major contribution to scholarship, I think, that assumed with absolute assurance uh, 
that only Athens mattered. Um, the clue was in the subtitle of the book, Athenian Drama in its Social Context. So this book described the context and the content of tragedy and comedy as expressions of Athenian democracy's deepest values and aspirations. And eventually it provoked challenges. Just how exclusively Athenian or democratic were the theatre and its genres? Well, the challenge to Athenian and the challenge to democratic followed slightly different paths. One of them explored theatre outside Athens, to quote the title of the late Kate Bosch's edited book of 2012. The other questioned whether theatre, and especially tragedy, could be said to be democratic or even political at all. Some people, like Jasper Griffin, emphasised the timeless, universal, philosophic and aesthetic quality of Greek tragic poetry. Others, like Peter Rhodes, without abandoning a historicist approach, looked for a deep structure in context, not in any specific city or constitution, but in the historical development of the Greek polis itself. The question becomes particularly urgent when we try to combine the two paths. If it's true that theatre was not just Athenian, does that mean that it also can't be characterised as democratic? Many states with theatres were autocracies, some were oligarchies, so how can we talk of theatre as being Athenian or democratic at all? Well, we took an empirical approach to this question. By looking at the data, we tried to decide if the various sources of evidence allowed us to match the reception of theatre with different constitutional regimes in Greece. This turned the question into one of reception, effectively trying to decide how the ancients thought on the basis of what they did. Some insight can be gained from the choices communities made in the 5th and 4th century as the new medium spread throughout the Greek world. Some states eagerly adopted theatre, others completely avoided it. Communities that did receive theatre similarly chose to accept or to avoid specific performance types and specific theatrical practices. Well, it's well known that contemporary authors say very little about the politics of the theatre. Aristotle is largely silent. There is notoriously no polis in Aristotle's poetics. Athens is mentioned there only three times, democracy once, all in relation to the disputed history of comedy. A bit less attention has been given to Plato, who definitely sees theatre as part of democratic culture. But here in the Republic, Plato claims that tragedy at least belongs more to autocratic culture. Tragic poets drag constitutions towards tyrannies and democracies. The word order is deliberate, because he goes on to say that tragic poets are honoured especially by the tyrants, and secondly, by democracy. But Plato, you might say, is a strange and biased witness, and his perceptions don't really reflect general attitudes. But was he right? Um, a close examination of over 120 sites yielded credible evidence of some form of theatre culture before 300 BC. We looked for evidence of a building that ancients or <coughs> moderns confidently identify as a theatre, Evidence for performances of the theatre genres of tragedy, comedy, satire play, or circular choruses that were performed in theatres, or some other strong index of theatrical culture, such as the prolific production of comic vase painting, painted pottery in Taras, which, along with indications from Aristoxenus, Plato, and others, makes it pretty certain that comedy and tragedy were performed in Taras throughout the fourth century. Of the cities we examined, Something around half, um, about 70, also gave evidence of their political configuration at the time that they took on theatre. In this list, reasonable uncertainty is marked with question marks. A question mark before the name of the city means doubt about the existence of theatre in that city. A question mark after it means that there's some uncertainty about its political complexion. Brackets means that we don't know which political... Um, uh, form it was at the time, so they're double listed. So Plato may have been right in assuming or in suggesting that autocracies were the most enthusiastic recipients of theatre, but he was wrong if he simply meant to imply numerical superiority. Our figures show twice as many democracies receiving theatre as autocracies, but he is most vindicated in the implication that theatre didn't appeal to oligarchs. Only four certain and five other possible oligarchic cities had theatre, compared with somewhere between 26 and 45 democracies, or 16 to 21 autocratically governed uh, cities. 
And this doesn't simply reflect the difference in the numerical ratios of classifiable 4th century regimes. Uh, Hansen and Nielsen's magnificent polis inventory calculates that 32.4% of classifiable 4th century regimes were oligarchic, against around about 407 being democratic. So let's assume that this figure could be applied for the 5th century as well, although if anything you'd expect more democracies in the 5th century than the 4th. You can see that democracy is still grabbing more of the theatrical pie on the right than it deserves according to its prevalence in the pie chart on the left. And the percentages don't change significantly if we take away those uncertain cases. The, the glutton share of the pie still belongs to democracy. So only somewhere between 6 and 12% of 5th and 4th century cities that had some form of theatre culture were oligarchic at the time it was introduced whereas the figure for democracies is close to 65. We'll see, moreover, that oligarchic theatre culture is not only sparse but odd and different in other ways. But first, let's have a look at democracy. So Athens created the single most important channel, I think, through which theatre spread. In the 5th century, the Athenian Empire, and in the 4th century, its Aegean hegemony in the form of the Athenian Second Confederacy. The most direct transfer was through the transplantation of bits of Athens itself. Direct imitation of Athens was normal for Athenian clerics and colonies. As Robert Parker put it some time ago, the clerics of the fourth century were little replicas of Athens, with their own councils and assemblies, and it's scarcely surprising to find such a basic amenity of Attic life as a tragic festival of Dionysus soon attested. The best examples of this category are Salamis, Lemnos and Samos. Salamis, although only less than two kilometres from the Attic mainland, was never incorporated into the Attic deem system. The island was settled by Athenians in the late 6th century and was probably a clericy from that time. The Athenians appointed an archon for Salamis and the Athpol says that that archon's single most important duty was poiein ta Dionysia, to make the Dionysia happen. Monuments show that Salamis had a Kerygic system of funding, tragedy and circular choruses by the end of the 5th century. Lemnos came under Athenian control around 500. The Athenians expelled the non-Greek native population and planted colonists to make the island entirely theirs. Recent exploration of the early Hellenistic theatre at Hephaestia has revealed an earlier 5th century phase. This 5th century theatre was superimposed on a native Lemnian sanctuary to a goddess whom the Athenian settlers worshipped as a form of Kybele or Demeter and associated with Dionysus, an association that was sympathetic to the incorporation of the Lemnian Dionysus within Attic and Eleusinian cult that we find in Euripides' Hypsipyle. From 348 we have inscriptions attesting a Dionysia, dramatic contests, a Kerygic system of funding and the announcement of public honours in the theatre but it's likely that these were part of Lemnian life already in the 5th century. <clears throat> Samos spent much of the 5th century as a more or less autonomous ally of Athens and first received an Athenian cleric after its revolt in 440, then a second one which involved the expulsion of the native population around about 365. The oldest honorific decree from Samos, which is this one up there, not that easy to read, I'm sorry, dates to around about 350, and it's issued by the Athenian clerics themselves. It provides, as you'll see, for the announcement of honours at the tragedies of the local Dionysia. Well, several other states owe their existence, uh, the existence of theatre culture in this way to Athenians abroad. The speaker of Antiphon's fifth oration claims that his father served as Kerigos in Mytilene after the lesbian revolt in 428, when Athens planted clerics... Athenian clerics probably also contributed to the development of theatre in Eritrea, on Euboea, Naxos and Andros. And the phenomenon may not be limited to the Aegean. Thurii in South Italy was in large part an Athenian foundation in the time of Pericles and many people believe that it was a major transfer point of Athenian culture, including theatre, to the wider region. More common still in the Aegean is the reception of theatre by democratic states subject to Athens. To reinforce their military and economic interests, Athens attempted to bind her Delian League allies with political and cultural ties. Two policies had important consequences for the history of the theatre. One, 
was Athens' general support for the democratic factions in allied cities. This reinforced Athens' imperial influence not only through the creation of common political values, but also through fear of political instability and the oligarchic reprisals that might follow a withdrawal of Athenian support. The other was a more direct involvement of allies within what Peter Rhodes has called the Imperial Festival, Athens' own great city Dionysia. It was to the Athenian Dionysia that allied cities were required to bring their tribute each year, probably beginning immediately after the transference of the treasury from Delos to Athens in 453, particularly revealing of the care Athens took to integrate uh, her subjects directly in the festival is this well-known decree of 372 that required the city of Paros to bring a cow and a phallus to the Dionysia, since they are in fact um, colonists of the people of Athens. Apoikoiontes to demu to Athenaion. Now this requirement is said to be traditional, kata patria, and we know we do know that colonists were indeed required to bring a phallus and a cow to the Dionysia from another decree of 445 that founded a colony of Brea. But the only basis for the assertion that Paros was a colony of Athens was Athens' own mythic claim to be the mother city of all the Ionians. So the example of Paros shows, or suggests very strongly, that all the Ionian cities were required um, to do the same thing, to send a cow and a phallus to the Dionysia. A cow and a phallus have to have someone to take them there, and they probably had a chorus or choruses to accompany them in the procession of the Athenian Dionysia. So the delegations that came from subject states were reasonably large, adding these chorus members to the officials who went to discuss international affairs with Athens. So we can safely assume that familiarity with the Athenian dynasty was widespread in the Athenian Empire from at least the middle of the 5th century. Now it might possibly be a mistake to regard this invitation to the dynasty as simply a form of Athenian imperial coercion. The tribute that they were required to bring was probably felt in that way from time to time, but the Dionysia made the burden sweeter. In fact, it seems that the Allies embraced the Dionysia as the symbol of the Empire's cultural power, because cities of the Empire are the largest and the most coherent group in the classical spread of theatre. Athenian subjects known to have theatre more than triple the number of cities that get drama through a more direct connection with Athens. So in general, the Aegean region presents several consistent features that can be ascribed to imitation of the Athenian model. The first is that they all were members of Athens' Aegean Empire of Maritime League. All of them, with the exception of Chios, were so far as we can tell, certainly or probably democracies at the time theatre was received. Chios is a special case that we'll come back to in a minute. In the third place, all the theatrical festivals are at least initially Dionysia, and this is definitely not the case elsewhere. And fourth, where evidence exists, all of them resemble the Athenian Dionysia in some form or another, in the competitive format, in the particular genres chosen, tragedy is almost universally attested, but comedy, satyr play, and men's and boys' lyric choruses appear throughout the region. Also in the way they're funded, similarly to the Athenian model, state-appointed choregoi, or in imitation of various other theatre practices that we know from Athens. Now a really striking example comes not from an Ionian city at all, but from Dorian Rhodes. Rhodes, which was founded by the great Sinoicism in 408 of the three pre-existing cities of the island, Ialusos, Kamiros and Lindos. Um, it may have been a Spartan-backed oligarchy at its foundation, but by 395 it had thrown, uh, it had revolted against Sparta and become a democracy, which it remained thereafter. Rhodes' founding cities had been members of the Delian League, and in 378, Rhodes itself became a founding member of the Second Athenian Confederacy. Probably from the very beginning of its democracy, and certainly by the 380s, Rhodes had a Dionysia with a program comparable to that of Athens, although hardly anyone knows about this stuff. It's not commonly um, talked about. Perhaps because our information comes somewhat unexpectedly from central Rome. Twenty fragments of inscriptions recording theatre productions were mostly recovered from medieval buildings or Renaissance collections, but three of them were excavated in modern times, all in the general district of Rome where the theatres of Pompey, Balbus and Marcellus were located. This is where the Temple of Hercules Musarum was located, 
and that is almost certainly the headquarters of the Roman guild of theatrical professionals, the Artifice Skyniki. <coughs> Since other fragments of the same date and style do mention these um, so-called artists, it's believed that this inscription, and I think rightly, decorated the walls of their office. And they must have had very big and very lavish offices because this was a vast, uh, huge inscription uh, to put on walls. Most fragments of these so-called Roman fasti deal with the Athenian festivals of the Dionysia and the Lanaia. But less well studied are eight fragments that deal with the Dionysia at Rhodes. <clears throat> All of these were found in the pavement of the church of San Paolo Fuori le Mura, which is where that eight marks the spot. Seven of those eight are now lost, uh, except for a transcription made of them, very fortunately, by the great grandnephew of Michelangelo, Filippo Bonarroti, a great etruscologist and numismatist. Internal evidence shows that this first century inscription copies a Hellenistic source. Now this inscription, these tiny fragments we have of this inscription, show that by the 380s, Rhodes had something resembling the Athenian Dionysia in scale and content. The San Paolo fragments detail the careers of star tragic actors. They're listed in the chronological order of their first victory at any of the three festivals. After each actor's name, follow all of his first place finishes, then second and third places with prizes in each category in chronological order. In addition to prizes and festivals, the inscription actually names the plays with which the actor competed and the authors of those plays. Because we, uh, you'll have trouble reading that, I'm sorry to say, um, but because of the total uncertainty of the length of the original lines, you see the fragments of these little splinters from much longer lines, it's really hard to know what part belongs to what festival. But Rhodes is mentioned in three places very clearly, en rodor, three times. In two places, the assignment of an actor to a tribe is also mentioned. You'll see the en rodor neme face allocated in Rhodes, and the other one that's highlighted says cameridi puler, to cameris the tribe, something has been allocated. So that shows that each set of tragedies was publicly funded by the tribes, a bit like the lyric choruses were at Athens. So there were therefore three events, three entries in the tragic competition, each one assigned to one of the founding tribes named for each of the original cities that formed the state of Rhodes, Eleusos, Camiros, and Lindos. Now no other source records <clears throat> more than a single prize for actors anywhere else, in Athens uh, included. So Rhodes has a special importance. Because of its tribal funding model, and because the actors here probably performed as the role, in the role of producers as well, all three of the actors were ranked. So Rhodian records offer detailed information about early actors that could not be found anywhere else at all. Athenian records named only the winning actor. Rhodian records ranked the actors first, second, and third, and they thereby gave later antiquity a special window onto the careers of the great famous actors of the classical period not only showing who won, but who beat whom with what. This explains surely why these Rhodian records were such, um, of such great interest to the Roman Actors Guild. So the actors on these inscriptions are also known, some of them from other sources. Menesithius, um, Thrasybulus, Aristodemus, Eupolemus, Cleandros, Philotades. The poets whose plays they directed are also famous people, international stars, and some of them may have included classics as well as contemporary tragedians. Our Sophocles is mentioned at least twice, probably more than twice. Um, it may be the elder Sophocles whose plays are being produced, and probably also Aristarchus is mentioned, Aristarchus of Tegea. Notice too that two satyr plays are mentioned, suggesting that at a time when in Athens, this genre was obsolescent and only performed in isolation outside the competition as a warm-up, Rhodes was still producing traditional tragic tetralogies with three tragedies and a satyr play. Other 4th century inscriptions show that the tribes appointed Karegoi to sponsor boys' choruses and later on men's choruses and comedy. The fragments of the Roman fasti give no evidence of comedy in the early 4th century, but the fact that Anaxandrides and Antiphanes, two of the most prolific poets uh, of the first half of the 4th century, were Rhodians, at least suggests that comedy was likely to feature in the early phase as well. 
So in other words, it looks as if from the creation of the democracy in 395, Rhodes had a full dynasia with everything and more than contemporary Athens offered, including competitions of men's and boys' choruses, tragic tetralogies with satyr play, comedy, competition for actors with three prizes, a system of Kerygic funding, a practice of setting up memorials for victories, and extremely accurate and detailed public archives recording competitors and winners. In fact, the presence of tetralogies with satyr plays suggests, if anything, that the Rhodians adopted and preserved a classic 5th century format after Athens itself had abandoned it. This impression is reinforced by information preserved by the historian Diodorus, who tells us that in 305, when under threat from Demetrius, the famous besieger who didn't actually besiege Rhodes, the Rhodians passed decrees liberating slaves, giving public burial for war dead, and giving a panoply of armour to their sons in the theatre at the Dionysia when they came of age. Now these provisions all are known from Athens, but the last is of special interest because it directly copies a pre-performance ritual of the Athenian theatre from much earlier in the century. Rhodian theatre culture thus follows the classic Athenian model to the letter, and arguably does so not out of any great love of Athens, but to adopt a paradigmatically democratic theatre culture. So Rhodes is close to a third category of reception. There were democracies with no particular political or historical link to Athens that embraced theatre purely as an expression of democratic culture. Another example would be some of the cities of Arcadia, somewhat unexpectedly, that had no part whatever in Athens' Aegean Empire. Spartan hegemony sat rather heavily over Arcadia until the Battle of Leuctra in 371, at which point the Arcadians threw off their oligarchies and became democracies. In addition, they formed the Arcadian League <clears throat> with a view to resisting a future Spartan resurgence, and they built the great city, Megalopolis, to serve as a capital. A monumental theatre stood at the very heart of Megalopolis's design and conception. The precise date of the first phase of the theatre of Megalopolis <clears throat> is not known, but we have compelling evidence for a theatre from the 360s, from reused blocks, those things with red arrows pointing at them, reused blocks of the original stage building that are found in the later 4th century Skerne. These blocks have cuttings for timbers, which indicates a prior wooden phase of the stage building. This was, as you can see from Pausanias, the biggest theatre in Greece, even in Pausanias's day. And it was a conspicuous emblem of new cultural aspirations of Arcadia. The 5th century theatre of Mantinea was rebuilt in Arcadia in stone at this time, and new theatres were built also at Tegea and Orchomenus. It's immediately after the liberation from Spartan hegemony that we hear of the first theatre in Figalia, where the oligarchic faction, before withdrawing to the safety of Sparta, took bloody revenge on the new democracy by swooping down on them as they sat in the theatre uh, and massacring as many as they could. Arcadia, moreover, seems to have adopted a uniform theatre culture. All the Arcadian cities had Dionysia and publicly funded contests, although in a different model from Athens. They were run by an agonothete, and there was a practice of each agonothete dedicating a chunk of theatre at the end of his office. The agonothetes dedicated front row thronoi, one of them dedicates an oketos, a drain, uh, so they kind of serially build and add to the theatre at the end of their term of office. We don't have any evidence of drama, but the Arcadian Polybius attests the popularity in what he regarded as antiquity of men's and boys' lyric choruses, specifically by composers associated with the first great wave of democratic theatre music, Philoxenus of Cythera and the famous um, Timotheus, famously laconophobic, hated in Sparta, very good for Acadia after you get rid of Sparta. <clears throat> so let's have a look quickly now at oligarchies. I noticed that there were surprisingly few oligarchies in our uh, list. And in fact, um, Caledon, Chironia and Thespiae are slightly more likely to have been democracies when their theatres were built, and Abydos, possibly an autocracy. So our focus needs to be on Chios, Megara, and Sparta. Now, unlike theatre in democratic cities, oligarchic theatre is, as I said, heterogeneous, idiosyncratic, though it has a few things in common. The first is that for a small group, there are a lot of early starters, um, a number of 5th century starts, especially um, early 5th century starts in Megara and Sparta in particular. 
Most of them had choral performances held in the theatre, but no fully mimetic drama, so far as we can tell. Megara is an exception because it had comedy, uh, but it was a comedy that was independent of the Athenian type and probably older. My um, colleague and great friend of this place, Dick Green, posits a regional form of comedy um, for Corinth as well, based on iconographic material alone. Perhaps the one thing that oligarchies do have in common is the complete avoidance of tragedy. We have no example, I know of no evidence, that any oligarchic state ever set up a tragic competition. In fact, the only evidence that we have for tragic performance in an oligarchic state comes from Athens, from Athens in 411 and 4043 and 321 to 307. And fourthly, <clears throat> the theatres or theatre festivals under oligarchies were for gods other than Dionysus, and the exceptions there are possibly Megara and certainly Chios. So in general, the few oligarchic states that had theatre remain independent of the main trends and independent in their own ways. Many developed theatre before you could even speak of an Athenian model. All seem to have kept somewhat aloof uh, from international trends until much later. By the middle of the 5th century, Megara produced a form of drama that other Greeks were happy to call Komodia, although modern scholars keep dismissing it as possenspiel, farce, and the like. Aristotle notes that both the Megarians of the mainland and those in their colony, also called Megara in Sicily, Megara Hiblea, claim to have invented comedy. This probably indicates shared origins in a period of cultural exchange between the mother city and her colony that would necessarily predate the destruction of Megara Hiblea by Gelon of Syracuse in 483, so very early. Moreover, the Megarians um, from the mainland of Aristotle's day, as you can see from this passage, although they were firmly oligarchic and had been for a very long time, they substantiated their claim to be the inventors of comedy by pointing out that they'd had a democracy earlier than Athens. Whether or not they had is, is anyone's guess. But by doing so, they were acceding to a belief that there was a connection between comedy and democracy that was somehow natural or the kind of argument you would be expected to make if you wanted to claim that you had invented it. There is nonetheless not a lot of evidence that the kind of political comedy we know from Aristophanes, Cratinus, and Eupolis ever featured very large in Megara. Well, classical Sparta had more than one building that could be called a theatron. One is attested by Herodotus in 486 as the place where during the Gymnopaedia, Demaratus received the public insult that led to his self-exile in Persia. This could be um, a 6th or early 5th century construction known as the round building in the Spartan Agora, that despite its name may not have been round, it may have only been semicircular. Um, Karunu and other archaeologists identify it as the theatre called the Koros by Pausanias, and Pausanias records that that was where the Gymnopaedia took place. But Greco has argued more recently that it is the Skias, where Pausanias saw the lyre of Timotheus with its strings cut by the ephors of Sparta who hated his music, on display presumably because that was the place where Timotheus had uh, made his uh, revolutionary musical performance. Whether it was semicircular or circular, it is the earliest theatron of either form anywhere attested. Sparta is also the source of this rather wonderful and neglected inscription, um, which gives us the evidence of the first surviving honorific seat from any theatre. In this case, a theatron in, in Laconian, a satron, in the sanctuary of Athena Alia. Our information about activities in Spartan theatres is relatively plentiful. They included local citizen choruses, probably divided by age, tribe and fratry, supported by a Kerygic system that Aristotle dates back at least to the post-Persian Persian War period, and in which the Karegoi served also as the pipers to the choruses. In addition, there were Kithrodic contests open to international competitors at the Carnea for Apollo, the Gymnopaedia, and the Hyacinthia, dating back possibly to the 7th century. Theatre music in archaic and classical Sparta was connected to Apollo, and possibly also Demeter, Artemis, and Athena. Significantly, we hear of no evidence for circular choruses um, and for drama until 105 AD, so way beyond 
my time limit. <clears throat> in perhaps one case, we can see Sparta transplanting its theatre culture to another oligarchic state in much the same way we saw Athens doing to its democracies under its dominion. At the time of the Spartan incursion into Boeotia, Agesilaus seems to have taken a role in transferring the rural sanctuary of the Valley of the Muses to Thespiae and in creating a new festival of the Muses there. But it is probably only after 372, when Thespiae came under control of now democratic Thebes, that the com competition included men's and boys' circular choruses and other events. In other words, the same pattern that we saw in Arcadia can also be seen in Boeotia. Despite its long and immensely rich musical and Dionysian history, the earliest evidence for theatre in Thebes comes immediately after the democratic coup in 379, that ousted the Theban oligarchs and the Spartan garrison that secured their position. Right after the coup, we see Epaminondas obtaining a loan from his fellow conspirators to sponsor a men's chorus. And then about a decade later, he finds himself on trial in the theatre for exceeding his constitutional powers. Now, a symmetrical but opposite situation existed in Chios, which I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> Chios was a non-tributary member of the Delian League and then a member of Athens' 4th century confederacy. And as such, they were allowed to maintain um, their oligarchic constitution, which seems to have swung between extreme and moderate oligarchy until about 330, when Alexander the Great imposed democracy. And Chios successfully resisted the theatre music that spread around the Aegean uh, like wildfire. And yet Dionysus was hugely important to this island, famous for its wine. Among other things, local legend had it that Dionysus' son, Oinopion, actually founded Chios. The magnificence of the Chian Dionysia is attested by this early 4th century author, Aeneas Tacticus, who singles out a very un-Dionysian feature of its otherwise um, lampras pompas, its brilliant processions. The Chians were so anxious um, that the license of the processions of the Dionysia might trigger a revolution that they regularly occupied in advance with guards and copious troops the roads opening onto the marketplace. They even kept, we're told by another source, Polymon, they kept their icon of Dionysus bound in chains. And after being democratized by Alexander, Chios seems only ever to have added a competition for boys' choruses to its festival. There's no evidence for drama or even men's choruses at any time in the island's long history. The fact that for centuries afterwards, Public honours were announced at the contest for boys' choruses, seems to guarantee the absence of those more prestigious genres of the theatre. And the absence is all the more astonishing given that Ion, one of the most renowned tragedians of the 5th century, was a Chian. We would have to conclude that Chians only ever got to hear Ion's tragedies when they weren't at home in Chios, whether they're in Athens or other places. And it says something about the uneasy relationship between Athens and its ally that Ion, for political reasons, embraced Athenian hegemony so enthusiastically that he claimed in his own history of the island that its founder was not Oinopion, or that its founder Oinopion was not a son of Dionysus at all, but a son of Athenian Theseus. Ion's phil Athenianism was shared by his son, who was a leader of the democratic faction, and whom the oligarchy put to death in 411 on a charge, as Thucydides tells us, of being pro-Athenian. So Chian Democrats opened their hearts both to Athens and tragedy as readily as the oligarchs closed theirs, and evidently for the same reasons. And that conclusion seems to be true of oligarchies <coughs> in general. Well, if Democrats and oligarchs <coughs> generally agree that theatre culture and drama in particular are democratic, this can't, I don't suppose, be shared by autocrats who, as Plato suggested, were even fonder of tragedy than democracy. Drama's success in autocracy certainly proves that there's nothing essentially democratic about it, even despite the powerful formal links between drama and dialogicity that many people have pointed out. But at the same time, we need to judge whether autocratic theatre can be quite the same thing as democratic theatre. Is there some sense in which democracy, or rather, I'm sorry, autocracy converts a dialogic form into a monologic one? Well, that's a much bigger question than I can even begin to frame here, but I'll just sketch instead some of the major differences in the theatre cultures of classical autocracies. <clears throat> 
So the autocracies that took on theatre are located on what we might very loosely call the barbarian fringe. Sicily, North Africa, Thessaly, Macedon, Caria, the Black Sea, and Cyprus. From round about 485 in Syracuse, the tyrants Gelon and Hieron took a very keen interest in theatre, as so did Dionysius I later in Syracuse. There were two 5th century theatres in Cyrene in North Africa, and the excavators have now dated the earliest phase of one of them to the first half of the 5th century, which puts it in the time of the Batiad monarchy. Macedon's engagement with theatre begins with the tyranny of Archelaus in 410. There's evidence for a decree from Magnesia that gave honours to Euripides during his lifetime, so it could be that Thessaly also received theatre about this time, though we only hear of it at Ferrae and Scotusa shortly after 370. Theatre and drama first appear in the Pontic region in Heraclea in the time of the Cleacid tyranny and as early as the 360s, and by 353 in the Cimmerian Bosporus ruled by the Spartacids. So there's a point to be made about this fringe pattern. It might be easiest to make it for Macedon, which for some ancient Greeks was actually beyond the barbarian fringe. Theatre in Macedon is a remarkable feature, um, a remarkable instance of the adoption of what was deemed to be a Greek cultural form by people who were deemed sometimes to be non-Greeks. But Greekness was precisely one of its greatest attraction for the Macedonian rulers. Theatre made Archelaus and his successors appear Greek to Greek eyes, and this was no small asset in both the economic and the military sphere. A major component of this Greekness, especially in the earlier period, was Athenianness. Given the income and goodwill Archelaus could generate by providing the raw materials to rebuild the Athenian fleet after it was destroyed in Sicily. The situation is similar in the Black Sea. The Spartacids of the half Scythian Cimmerian Bosporus literally traded on their Athenianness. They personally controlled the very lucrative export in grain and raw materials to Athens, to the point that on one occasion Athens directly intervened to save them from a coup, and on another turned a blind eye to their occupation of an Athenian outpost, while giving Spartacid Athenian, Spartacids Athenian citizenship and heaping them with other honours. So another common feature of autocracies is that, like oligarchies, their um, festivals, theatre festivals, are not normally Dionysia. In Syracuse, the theatres are associated with sanctuaries of Apollo or Demeter and Corre. And that, in fact, appears to be true of most theatres in Sicily, as it was in Cyrene. In Macedon, the first theatre festivals were for Olympian Zeus and the Muses. Only in the Black Sea region are the theatre festivals for Dionysus, and so in conformity with the Athenian Aegean Koine. Thirdly, unlike oligarchs, autocrats happily supported all major genres. They loved tragedy, comedy, circular choruses, even satyr play. The evidence confirms Plato's claim that tragedy had a special appeal for, for autocrats. We do, however, also find comedy flourishing under the Syracusan tyrants, though it may have been of a less political and more philosophical kind than its Attic counterpart. Comedy is also attested at the Macedonian court from the time of Archelaus and under Philip and Alexander. The life histories of the most famous poets of lyric choruses are bound tight with the tyrants of Macedon and Syracuse. Archelaus kept Melanipides and Timotheus at his court. Dionysius of Syracuse kept Philoxenus, perhaps literally in the stone quarries, if we believe ancient traditions. And it is notably Kinesias who proposed the famous honorific decree at Athens for Dionysius in 393. And the Kinesias acts as much as a poet of circular choruses as an Athenian, is suggested by the fact that this is the first decree that we know of to have been set up actually inside the theatre of Dionysus. Alexander the Great sponsored the whole gamut, including satyr play. Though the Black Sea autocracies give direct evidence only of unspecified drama, the presence of Xenotimus, the son of the tragedian Carcinus in the Bosporan kingdom as a diplomatic courier, suggests that tragic performance in the early 4th century and a Kerygic relief indicates comic performance there a few decades later. Cyrene, at least in the 4th century, had tragedy, dithyram, probably also comedy. <clears throat> Fourthly and finally, classical autocrats began the process of personalising theatre that characterises all subsequent Hellenistic practice. And this personalisation affects every aspect of the theatre, the occasion, the performers, the theatre space, 
the performance itself. And it's an important contrast to the public nature of democratic theatre. Well, as for the occasion, um, sources for Syracusan and Macedonian theatre often imply that festivals were arranged simply at the whim of the autocrat. Literary evidence for performance under Philip and Alexander often takes the form of something like this. Having transacted this business, he went back to Macedonia. He conducted the sacrifice to Zeus Olympios, which had already been established by Archelaus, and he arranged the games, the Olympics, at Aigai. Some people say that he also put on a contest for the muses. This sort of thing appears even in the accounts of campaigns in distant lands, so there's absolutely no question of it simply being booked into a regular calendrical festival. From the very beginning, autocrats made theatre occasional, and the occasions marked milestones in the autocrat's CV. The founding of cities, dynastic weddings, military victories, royal funerals. Even when the festivals are named for gods, they seem to be timed to fit the autocrats and not the gods' busy schedule. As for performers, Syracusan and Macedonian autocrats, as I've said, bound poets and actors to them with gifts and favours. Many famous poets became poets in residence. Even Pixodarus, the hecatomnid tyrant and satrap of Caria, relied on actors as confidants in his secret negotiations with Philip. This kind of intimacy was extremely useful if you wanted to conjure up a theatre festival quickly. Consider Plutarch's phrase a bit like the one I quoted before. Alexander dealt with urgent business and once more turned his attention to theatre and festivals when 3,000 scenic artists arrived from Greece. The scene is Ekbatana, 1,500 kilometres from the eastern limit of the Mediterranean in western Iran. Actors really did drop everything and run, as did Athenodorus, we know, the great tragic actor, who stood up the Athenians at their Dionysia in 331, knowing full well that Alexander would pay his fine for non-appearance at their festival and give him lots more besides. It's no coincidence that at precisely this time, Athens starts issuing civic decrees to honour theatrical performers and in some cases prominently cite the fidelity of the honorand to the Athenian people, indicating that they weren't so uh, faithful after all. <clears throat> As for theatre space, uh, Jean-Charles Moretti in particular has drawn attention to the monumentality and the innovation that marks Sicilian and Macedonian theatre architecture. Gelon of Syracuse may have constructed a monumental theatre that was not only grander than its Athenian counterpart, but may have even served as his tomb. The archaeological evidence is hotly debated and only partially published. Autocrats vied with one another and with non-tyrannical states, especially Athens, to assert a kind of geopolitical primacy in what looks like a race to build the largest or the most magnificent stone theatre. Moretti, in fact, suggests that Macedon succeeded in building a horseshoe-shaped stone theatre before the famous Lycurgan theatre in Athens that we're so familiar <coughs> with, and may also have created the first ever Proscenion theatre. The performance and its personalisation. Autocratic use of theatre as propaganda, to use a fairly loose term, is notorious. Aeschylus's command re-performance of the Persians in Syracuse placed Hieron's military achievements in the West on equal footing with those of the Greeks in repelling Persia in the East. His extraordinary play, Aeschylus's extraordinary play, The Women of Etna, validated the foundation of the new city of Etna in 475 at hugely destructive cost to its informer inhabitants who were ejected. In the Archelaus, Euripides spliced the tyrant Archelaus into the royal lineage of Argos, made him a direct descendant of Heracles, and turned Archelaus at a stroke from tyrant to hereditary king with a firm endorsement from Zeus. But autocrats insinuated themselves into theatrical performances in other more subtle ways, into the processions and ceremonials that precede the competitions, for example, imprinting themselves as the head of state and chief transactor of sacrifice to the gods. The unfortunate downside from their point of view of this was that the propaganda worked best when the tyrant's dragoons were absent and so such occasions offered excellent opportunity for assassination, as in the case of Philip of Macedon and Clearchus of Heraclea. Tyrants could insinuate themselves even more fully into the performances. Dionysius of Syracuse and Mamercus of Catane both wrote tragedies. Brigitte Le Guin even speculates that Alexander the Great himself wrote a satyr play called the Agen. 
Dionysius's tragedies included openly autobiographical content through which the autocrat, autocrat depicted himself as a good tragic king. And as the theatre was the main forum in which he met his subjects face to face, image making and careful orchestration of the tyrant's appearance in the theatre led to a theatricalization of the tyrant himself. Cleacus, Dionysius and Demetrius the besieger are all said to have dressed like tragic kings. Dionysius even tried to confuse himself with Euripides. <clears throat> He's said to have acquired the instruments with which Euripides composed his tragedies and dedicated them in the sanctuary of the Muses after inscribing them with his own name and Euripides. Dionysius's kinsman and spin doctor, Philistus, is probably responsible for the false synchronization of the day Euripides died with the day Dionysius became tyrant in Syracuse. A suggestion, if not an actual assertion, of the reincarnation of the dead poet in the tyrant. Dionysius is probably also the first tyrant to fashion himself as an incarnation of Dionysus. He had the name, after all, a trick that Alexander, Demetrius, the Ptolemies and Seleucids perfected. <clears throat> well, before concluding, let's um, ask if autocratic states had any role in the spread of theatre that might rival Athens' role in disseminating it to her colonies and imperial subjects. Well, this, I think, is obviously true in Central and East Greece, where Philip, Alexander and his successors founded and rebuilt many cities with theatres. The evidence in West Greece is more mixed. Syracusan Aetna, founded by Hieron on the site of Katane, probably had a theatre from its foundation in 475. And possibly so too did Hellerus. <clears throat> Dionysius founded the city of Tyndarus in 396, and it looks like it, its original um, city plan, had a theatre as part of its design. Dionysius also founded, or at least expanded, the city of Issa, um, modern Biz, in the northern Adriatic, whose Roman theatre is now known to have over, uh, been built over a Greek predecessor, and from which <clears throat> a 4th century comic scene, probably of local manufacture, was published just last year. But despite local promotion by tyrants, classical theatre in West Greece seems just as often to be a phenomenon of democratisation. Several cities adopted drama <clears throat> under the democratic regimes that sprang up after the tyrants were kicked out of Sicily. Gela, for example, seems to have created a dramatic festival at the tomb of Aeschylus in a context of what Eric Robertson calls vigorous democratisation following the expulsion of the tyrant. Acragas, theatre discovered there just a year or two ago, probably or possibly adopted theatre after it got rid of its tyrants in 472. Agirian, Locri and Region, cities founded or dominated by Dionysius, only built their theatres after his death when their constitutions had changed from oligarchy to democracy. So did 5th and 4th century Greece view theatre as democratic? Well, in many, perhaps most cases, I think the answer would be yes. Democracy was a major factor driving Greece's theatrical revolution in the late Archaic and Classical periods. Athenian colonies embraced theatre as part of their democratic heritage. The cities of Athens, Aegean Empire and hegemony also seemed generally to have adopted theatre practice as close to the Athenian model as they could afford. Most tellingly, oligarchies either avoided theatre altogether or if they had theatre, they avoided drama and none, so far as we know, ever received tragedy. There are striking examples of states like Rhodes, Thebes and the cities of Arcadia that embraced theatre as soon as they threw off the oligarchic yoke and became democracies. And examples of oligarchic cities like Chios that remained doggedly theatre-less despite their close integration into Athens' Aegean Empire. <clears throat> oligarchic Megara and Sparta that already had theatre traditions remained idiosyncratic and failed to conform to the more common theatre culture that developed around them. All this shows that the spread of theatre, or its failure to spread in some areas, was due to a perception that it was linked in some way with democratic culture. Or at least this is true in the Greek heartland. The Peloponnese, Attica, the Aegean, and even parts of the Greek West. <clears throat> the autocratic regimes on the fringe of the Greek world, however, clearly saw nothing irredeemably democratic about it at all. On the contrary, they embraced it in full as an ideal instrument for maintaining and developing their power and prestige. So in answer to the question, was Greek theatre culture perceived as democratic in the 5th and 4th centuries, 
you would have to say generally <clears throat> yes and no, or address the specifics of time, place, and purpose. The question of how <clears throat> broadly and how long theatre culture was perceived as Athenian is more difficult to answer. But certainly this perception is at the heart of its spread throughout Athenian colonies and clerichies. Aegean cities might have been tempted when it was convenient to regard theatre as rather more part of a common heritage than something strictly Athenian. <coughs> but the reluctance of places like Sparta, Thebes or Megara, traditional enemies of Athens and its empire, to adopt or adapt their theatre culture may owe something to a perception that Athens was implicated no less than democracy. In the case of the Macedonian and Black Sea autocracies, theatre's Athenianness may in fact have proved part of the initial attraction, not least because they shared strong economic interests with Athens and its empire. Athens, in turn, frequently can be seen shoring up the autocrats' political and social authority, quite independently of the cultural power it exerted through theatre. Paradoxically, then, the reception of theatre, and especially drama, in the rest of Greece, even by autocracies, in many ways affirms rather than undermines the importance of both democracy and Athens in the first two centuries of its history. But at the same time, it would be a serious mistake to fall back on the old assumption that therefore the only context that really matters for interpreting drama or any other form of theatre culture in this period are democratic and Athenian. Even if the democratic and Athenian glamour of theatre seems to have stuck long and hard, each time, place and purpose might allow for a strong or a weak perception of those associations. Indeed, Athenian primacy in theatre was frequently and increasingly challenged. Autocrats, especially in Macedon and Sicily, increasingly challenged Athens' economic and moral primacy in the theatre industry. Other Greek cities, particularly in the 4th century, claimed to be the inventors of tragedy, of comedy, and even of satyr play, above all Dorian and Peloponnesian cities. The challenges, particularly in the case of Syracuse and Megara, were not without foundation. Though, of course, the real issue was never just setting the historical record straight. It was to pry further at the values that contemporaries projected onto theatre and to undermine further the common perception that the medium was, in fact, a vehicle of democratic and Athenian values. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. That was a tour de force. Um, uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, uh, so many different uh, questions, really. Uh, I'm sure there are even more in the room. I, I suppose w w I, I had one which was almost more an observation. Well, it was <coughs> based on what you what you raised, but then left that. Uh, turning a dialogic form into a monologic form. And uh, then I think later you were more, um, you seemed to me to be suggesting more not that, that rather than um, becoming monologic, mm -hmm. what they're doing is, is having a different type of dialogue or, or interpreting a dialogue in a different way when mm -hmm. the tyrants, as it were, uh, <coughs> adopt uh, a tragic mode. And I, I suppose one can see how that can work with a, a tyranny um, because there's so much in tragedy about the individual in and his mm. relationship with society and you can you can either interpret that as it were from the point of view of the many um, or, yeah. or from the point of view of the one um, but you're not in tragedy left without uh, if, you, if you're trying to if you're a, 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 a a tyrant, you're not uh, left without models, um, even sympathetic models. Um, uh, if you if you look at the the excellent tragedies, so you, in a sense, in a very real sense, you don't need to dismantle the the thing. You just need to yeah. lay a slightly different stress on it. Is that is that is that reasonable? Yeah, look, I think that's a very a really good point um, because, as you say, I mean, th there's debate even isn't there even about tragedy in Athens as to it having something for everyone of whatever political colour you come to it with. So if you're a, yeah. you're a rich oligarch sitting in the audience annoyed that you had to pay for this performance, you could at least think, well, they're my guys up there on the stage yeah. of the kings and all those glorious ones on whom all these little guys are ultimately completely dependent. Yeah. So, yes, if you sort of twist that and sort of crank up the volume a bit in an autocratic state and you've got 
uh, you know, a sole power of, of authority like that, mm. um, you could t you could uh, certainly tweak it in that way um, uh, with with relative ease, you'd imagine. Um, although there are, I imagine, I mean, it would be really nice to know. I mean, we know that the Persians was put on in Syracuse, and you can see the obvious, you know, pragmatism of that, that, you know, we are like the defenders of Greece in the West, just like those... Uh, you know the Spartans and uh, and the coalition of the Greeks in uh, in mainland Greece. We d we kept away the Carthaginians and uh, and so on. So that's more a message to the wider Greek world in a sense. You know we can stand on this stage just as proudly as they they can. Uh, the women of Etna. If only some papyrus would find the full remains of the women of Etna for Aeschylus uh, at the foundation of this city. Uh, you know I would possibly give one kidney if not an arm for that um, but uh, but it's a strange and what we do know about it makes it clear that it's a really strange play that um, seems so far as we can say to actually validate this extraordinary act of you know mass forced migration ethnic cleansing of the pre-existing city of Katana turning it into now a good Dorian city uh, it seems to have created a mythic model to do that and critics um, sort of twist themselves into all sorts of contortions by saying, how could, you know, the great fighter at Marathon, Aeschylus, the great Democrat from Eleusis, how could he possibly have done that? But it's obvious that he did, actually. Um, so, so there are, I mean, not to take anything away from your point, there are, there is evidence of some kinds of dramas for autocrats that really did bang home the message that they yes. wanted to hear, quite yes. clearly. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, now I'm not I'm not going to hog the, uh, the 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 questions any longer. Can I ask uh, a anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question? Can we please give you a microphone so your question can be recorded for posterity? Um, okay, the, uh, the lady behind and then oh, and yeah. Bill. Hi, thank you very much. Um, my question is about um, um, the um, you know the the um, the, the god. Um, with, to which they, you know, they, these um, kind of replica festivals um, were, um, you know, dedicated. And you say that, um, you know, in the autocratic states, generally it wasn't the case that, you know, uh, Dionysus, uh, I mean, it was a festival for Dionysus. Um, and I think you've written some, you know, you've, you and other scholars have written somewhere that, um, you know, Demeter and Persephone are kind of more you know, dominant kind of, you know, uh, divine presences in such um, festivals. I mean, my first question is what's happening? I, I'm not sure exactly what is what is the case in the, you know, in the uh, eastern side. So in the, you know, in the uh, in the Black Sea, mm -hmm. um, is is that still the case? Um, uh, and uh, secondly, <coughs> perhaps more importantly, is it that you know Dionysus is perceived as you know having kind of democratic allegiances as a god and perhaps other divinities do not so much yeah thank you very much um in for the black sea question i'm pretty sure uh from memory that they are actually Dionysia there i mean they okay. seem to be the ones that so far as we can tell slightly buck the autocratic trend in that sense but um fit more the aegean Kind of okay. trend. So I think I have to go back and look <laughs> detail, but I'm pretty sure that you do get Dionysia on the. I'm, I'm sure you get Dionysia on the Black Sea. I'm not sure whether they're all all the evidence is consistent in that respect. But you, your other point, I think, is a really good one, um, and it's a big and hard to answer. Really, uh, I mean, the question is whether Dionysus, um, <clears throat> for us, and you know, post his association with theatre and everything we associate with theatre, has become sort of fully democratized, as it were, or whether he was and is forever everywhere like that. Uh, I mean, I, I guess Kios would be an interesting case. They, bound, they bind him in chains. They bind their icon of Dionysus in chains. So, um, and and when, they're, when they're sort of frightened oligarchs, that's what you do to Dionysus. So <laughs> you, could, you could use that as evidence in, in that uh, direction, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> the Demeter issue, I'm not... Um, uh, I think you'd have to look carefully at each place. I mean, in in Sicily, certainly, probably almost certainly in Syracuse, I think it is Demeter more likely in Persephone uh, that the theatre cult is associated with. But I think in some cases, um, you know, I think theatre just ends up getting lodged 
in, in a big important sort of polyadic cult just because it is a big important polyadic cult. I mean, that sounds a kind of banal answer, but I think in some ways it's possibly true that in some cities where Dionysus isn't particularly prominent, then it would be something quite different to import the entire cult religious framework mindset and insert it in a, in a pantheon just because you wanted to have theatre a lot easier to bring theatre and worship other deities with it. Mm. Yes, uh, yes. So I, I, my, my gut feeling is that's what yes, happens yes. in those cases. Okay, cases. Yeah, thank you very much. Can I ask you to pop <coughs> the microphone forward to Professor Furley? Thank you very much. Oh yeah, thank you very much for that. That was wonderful. I was also going to ask something about Dionysus, but an another question. Um, I got the impression you were talking um, a lot about people in the spread of theatre, individuals. For example, this fascinating inscription from Rome. <laughs> you were talking about the actors who mm -hmm. you could pick out, famous actors and famous poets. You know, who were, uh, I got the impression you were saying these were, and I'm sure you're right, uh, responsible in some way for the, <coughs> or partly responsible for the spread of theatre. So my question is to look at a different possible approach. What about texts? I mean, you didn't talk about texts at all, but we know in this period that texts were being bought more and more and were being spread. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to be difficult finding any evidence, I know. This may be a, mm. a rather um, irritating question. <laughs> but maybe from sources, one can uh, say something about the, the use of texts in the, in the, and the spread, indeed, of texts mm -hmm. as, a, as an important factor in this. And they would be coming from Athens a lot, I'm sure. Um, the spread of comedy I'm thinking of particularly. Uh, anyway, this hmm. question. Yeah, no, look, thank you. Um, I mean, texts don't set up theatres, if you see what I mean. So texts themselves need agency to turn them into yeah. an institutional framework, don't they? So I completely agree that um, texts are spreading and that they're part of the picture, and I agree that it's a difficult question to, mm -hmm. to pull out exactly what contribution the kind of the, the availability maybe of you know texts had in this but but ultimately you need um, human agency to to get a theater going because it's not just I mean you can sit there and read it out to a group of people in an agora but theater is really uh, investment heavy you know it's you know to get to get proper actors who people might want to come and pay and see to get a chorus trained, to get a structure that is requires a huge amount of um, some kind of centralized engineering in a way that other forms of uh, performance and literature, literary production, don't really need quite so much. So I <clears throat> don't want to leave you with the idea that I think it's all about individual actors thinking, hey, it'd be great if we had a, a Dionysian Rhodes, because I don't think it works like that either. I, I'm, I mean, perhaps by focusing on... Uh, on uh, regime types, I slightly faced the actual importance of polis entities doing this or, or, or people within, groups within polis entities saying, we really want theatre, how do we go about doing it? How do we on earth go about contracting to get Athena Doris to come to us now when he's you know, going off east for, for, for months on end and so on? So, so I, I would, um, you know, I, I, I would like to know more about the way texts play into this in their circulation, but I but I would put a lot of emphasis on the kind of more collective role of, of, uh, of states in, in the spread. Any more questions? Yes, hello, in the, in the back. Um, gentleman in the back. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes. I I, it's I a microphone. I think it's just recording. I uh, just want to, uh, to ask you, how does this map out to on other festival activities? I mean, you mentioned, for instance, when you were discussing these, uh, these rulers in the margin, that they were also at the whim setting up all kinds of agonistic festivals. And of course, there were athletic and other competitions. Have you tried to map these things on to each well, other? Well, it's taken me 10 years to get this far, just, just looking at, at theatre, uh, strictly speaking, theatre festivals. Um, but all I can say is I would love it to be spread, to be expanded, to look at the whole gamut of, you know, contests, para theatrical festival activities, all that stuff. And as I'm sure you know, there's lots of fantastic work, including, I think, by yourself, 
on 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 the way festivals you sort of you know aggregate all these different things and um, grow and spread in these ways uh, and it would be wonderful to have a bigger picture of the way that sort of is like a Venn diagram with the theatrical variety but but you know let, let it happen is all <laughs> I can say about that really we'll do our best yeah um, here we go Yes, this may be a bit far out, but um, drama was the most revolutionary way of, tra uh, of telling a story which, and until the advent of film. Uh, have you considered possibly about the sort of the use of film in its early stages and how it developed and how uh, people like Goebbels and uh, Stalin took over so that they brought in the uh, autocratic, if you like, yeah. or the uh, <clears throat> fascist ideology. I mean, it was already there, but if you think that we associate early cinema with the French and a bit later with the Americans as well, uh, they, it seems to me there could be some uh, interesting parallels to be drawn. Yeah, look, the answer is no, I haven't, but um, yes, I should. And um, I think I, I can only agree completely that um, film is is a lovely parallel because of its because of its kind of soft cultural power, which is huge, uh, or not so soft cultural power in some ways. In the examples you've given, um, so but I can only say thanks, and and I should really uh, should really you know dig that direction as well. Okay, I think I think perhaps um, we should we should uh, thank the speaker first, and uh, there is some wine outside. Um, which we should make sure that the speaker gets some of. Um, uh, but first, I, I think we should all thank him for again for a, a really, a really splendid lecture with lots and lots of thought-provoking things uh, for us to take away and think about. Um, it, if, if, if you build it, apparently they will come. Um, but uh, thank you very much indeed, Peter. It really was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.